Welcome to the Killer Boobies Podcast, Unraveling Breast Implant Illness. Here's your hosts, Wendy Bunnell, Leslie Smoot, and Brandy Vega. Dr. Rankin, we are so excited to have you on our podcast today. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So you just have a fabulous reputation, I have to tell you. I know a lot of women who have actually gone to your office and had surgery, and they rave. They rave about your personality, your bedside manner, that you are very attentive. They rave, number one, that you are meticulous and an artist, that when they come out of surgery and they look at their breasts, keep in mind the ladies I'm talking to have had explant surgery. They've gone from a larger breast size to a smaller breast size. That can scare women. They can think, oh no, I'm going to look like a sock with a rock. <laughs> they're worried that they're gonna hang badly and look badly. And when they come away from your office, they're thrilled. They're thrilled with their results. And so first I want to applaud you and say thank you for being so meticulous and so kind and caring with your patients and that your reputation definitely runs miles ahead of you. And I just have to give you a shout out for all of that. So thanks for joining us and for talking with us about plastic surgery for explant women. No, it's my pleasure and thanks for those kind words. Yeah, you bet. So I noticed that a year ago you announced out loud to um, the world that you are no longer doing breast implant surgeries. And I just wondered, would you chat with us about your decision to do that? Um, sure, you know, I, over the last number of years, um, I've been doing so many explants I usually do a lift. There's a lot of unique challenges with doing a proper X plan, doing a lift at the same time. Um, so I've really been able to hone my focus on one procedure um, and try and become the best that I can doing that type of procedure. Um, I, I'm doing so many X plans that I just said, you know what, this is what I'm gonna make the main focus of my practice. Um, it's challenging, but my patients are, are feeling better. And um, the, the aesthetic component is really important to me too, is making, you know, and, and unfortunately I can't, I can't get it on everybody, but just making women feel and, and look the best they can afterward also is really important to me. I really like what you said, and I'd like to mention something to women because my father-in-law was a surgeon, plastic surgeon, and it's really a good idea to find out what your surgeon is an expert in. Dr. Rankin, you are known as an expert that does breast explant surgery and that is fantastic because what that means is that you have a lot of experience you know what to look for and this is important for somebody going in for explant surgery well it's like anything else in life experience is the key so um, you know if you want to get your gallbladder removed you want to go to a doctor that does a tremendous amount of, of cholecystectomies if you want brain surgery in a specific you know, type, you want to go to the doctor that does it that way all the time. So um, it's just experience, um, you know, uh, whether it's myself or one of my colleagues that do a lot of explant surgeries, I, I think it's important to go to a doctor that um, has a lot of experience under their belt. Yeah. So maybe you could tell us what would be a proper explant surgery? What would that look like? What are the techniques that you're doing and why are you doing them? So when you put in an implant in the body, your body's going to try and wall it off. Um, it sees it as foreign, so it forms a scar tissue or a capsule around it. Um, a lot of the thought process is that the capsule itself can be problematic. Okay, Mo most of this evidence is it's anecdotal. However, if we're there and we're removing the implant, let's just take the whole capsule out too to make sure that all the scar tissue is gone. Um, there's no reaction to the foreign body. Um, so basically we're starting fresh so the patient can fully heal. Um, when we talk about end block, end block is just really a type of total capsulectomy. Total capsulectomy means the whole capsule comes out and that's what we always want to do in every surgery. When it comes out in one unit around the implant, that's an end block. We always strive for an end block, uh, but if any doctor tells you they get one every time, it's just not true. Um, it's much easier when they're over the muscle to get an end block, but when you're under the muscle, in, in my hands, an end block, I, I get about 40, sometimes 50% of the time with an under the muscle. But you always go back and make sure you remove all that capsule. Mm. 
Okay, so if someone's under the muscle, you'll do the best you can to get it out and block, and, and then you might have to look further to see if there's some capsule left behind. Well, the capsule, when it's under the muscle, it becomes, in some cases, very adherent to the chest wall. So mm -hmm. to the periosteum on the ribs, um, to the intercostal uh, muscle area, and immediately below that area is the lung. So that's why you have to be so meticulous and so careful. Yeah, I've heard that you do have to be careful. So there's a couple of things that make you a unique surgeon. And one of those things that makes you unique is that you do a, a J-wrap lift. And I wonder if you might be able to tell us what a J-wrap lift is. And the biggest reason I'm asking a question about a lift is if a woman's going from a larger breast size to a smaller, or if over time her breasts are kind of drooping down, that often the idea of a lift comes into the conversation, either by necessity or by desire. So tell us how the J-wrap works. Uh, well, so when women have implants, they, they basically act as long-term tissue expanders. So they expand the volume of the breast tissue and the breast skin. So if you just go ahead and acutely remove all of that volume, you're going to be left with a lot of extra skin. So um, I think that most women, the majority of women in my practice uh, benefit from and want to lift at the same time. So they don't have that droop after the implant is removed. So the J wrap is a modification of lift techniques that have been done for many, many years in the plastic surgery community. The J just means it goes off to the side off to the side. So it's really like an L and like a J. What I've tried to do is minimize the scarring towards the midline of the patient's body. So after the fact, once they heal, when they're wearing something that shows off cleavage, like a gown or a bikini, um, you don't see a big scar. Um, that's really the premise of the, the scar component of the J wrap. The wrap part is taking the tissue that the patient has and wrapping or rotating it more behind the nipple areola just to give a little bit more appearance of volume postoperatively. So it's a combination of trying to produce volume in the right place and minimizing scarring. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, the volume is going to be a little higher because of that technique. Is that right? That's, that's what I anticipate doing on every patient. Of course, the more breast tissue that my patients have to begin with, the more volume they can achieve um, utilizing their own tissues. Uh, you know, my patients that are very, very, very thin, um, they don't really see the volume, but they do still see the benefit of the reduced scars. Yeah, and the benefit of the re reduced scars is great. I know that I have an anchor uh, scar because I did a lift after my explant, and if I'm wearing a low-cut swimsuit, I, ha I have to really pay attention to the swimsuit or you will see my scars. And so I like that you're thinking about the V-neck and the gowns or the swimsuits and, and not having your scar exposed. I mean, you really don't want to see the scar. So we appreciate that. The, and I also think it's easier recovery with the fewer incision lines. Is that correct? You can make that argument too. It just lost areas to heal afterward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, since we're talking about lifts, can you tell us, are there any risks with getting a lift? Um, I mean, there's risks with any surgery, as we know. You know, there's um, yeah. Um, every patient comes in with an individual surgical and medical history. So, if you're very cautious and prudent and meticulous in preparing your plan, you can avoid potential complications. One of the complications that a lot of doctors will talk about is necrosis or problems with blood supply to the the nipple. Um, after a patient has already, maybe, maybe they've had two lifts before or, you know, a couple of implant exchanges and capsulectomies. Um, so you have to modify your procedure based on their surgical history. So with that being said, if a patient has had a previous anchor scar and has no operative report or no information on it, well, then in those situations, I can't do a J-Rap because it could lead to potential complications. So Mm -hmm. I modify, modify my technique on every patient and safety is always number one. You never want any, any bad complications. Right, right. So some women can go numb in the nipple. It just depends on the woman to some degree. 
Yeah, it depends on mostly on their past surgical history, what incisions were used, whether or not they've had a lift in the past, mm -hmm. amount of tissue present, um, things like that. So if a woman had her implants tucked in underneath the breast, um, meaning the incision was underneath the breast, kind of at the bra line, and never had any cuts around the nipple, does that mean she has a lower likelihood of losing sensation on her nipple with a lift? Um, the sensitivity in, in patients postoperatively, the, the risk is still there, whether you do just an explant, explant with lift, the nerves that supply sens sensation to the nipple, they run, run along the chest wall and then they go up through the breast. So, um, women can lose sensitivity just with breast augmentation, just explant. So there's a lot of different factors that come into play. It's not necessarily an incision around the areola that causes mm -hmm. this. Okay. All right, one other question on the same topic. If someone has had surgery and they've lost a little sensation on the nipple, does that ever come back in time? Like whatever's been damaged kind of comes back together so that the sensation or sensitivity comes back? Well, most women with breast surgery, they do have loss of a sensation, usually for four to six months in the bottom part of the breast. And that usually comes back. With nipple loss, um, Occasionally, you'll see some reinnervation over time and um, regaining of some some sensation. Um, but once you lose it in the nipple, the chances coming back are are they're they're smaller. But I have seen it happen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. And what about fat transfer? Do you do fat transfers? And do you think that's a a decent option for someone who wants a little more fullness without an implant? Well, I, I will do fat transfers for my explant patients after six months of healing time as a primary source of breast augmentation. Uh, I'm not there yet in my practice. I know there's some doctors that have had some reported success with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that you provide videos. I've seen them in the um, breast implant awareness groups of the videos of your explant surgeries. And it's fascinating to me because I've seen that you've pulled an explant out doing total capsulectomy it comes out of the woman and it's all wrapped up with the skin. And then you've pulled out another capsule. Tell me about that. Are you able to look around and find an old capsule from another surgery that a woman might have had? Yeah, sometimes there's double capsules with, let's say a patient had implants above the muscle, they had issues, and then they were, were replaced below the muscle. So in those situations, sometimes you can find multiple capsules. So um, when I'm in there, I always explore everything and just, you know, for peace of mind, make sure everything is out. Let's say a woman had explant surgery, but um, she was still concerned that maybe there was capsule left behind and she might have different reasons for thinking that. And if she comes into you, uh, do you, you've been able to go in and explore and see if you can pull out any old capsule left behind. Could you tell us what you've seen and what you've experienced? Um, yeah, so we always start with the operative report, you know, let's, let's, let's review it and see maybe the doctor did a, you know, partial capsulectomy, which means just removed part of the capsule. Um, the patient's still experiencing a lot of issues um, and wants to go in and see if the capsule can be removed. Um, yeah, so I've done that, um, you know, it's not what I do mostly, but I do quite a bit of it um, and just remove any remaining capsule or tissue that's present. Okay, great. And has that been beneficial for some of those patients? Has there been a positive outcome for them after that surgery? Um, yes, there has been. Um, you know, when you talk about removing capsule and patients getting better, you know, I have to say it's anecdotal, right? We don't have any evidence-based studies. We don't have any diagnostic tests. You know, we can only say, you know, uh, I'm on some patients that are very sick, again, ruled everything else out, having a ton of health issues, and they have these issues, it's something to try. Um, and fortunately, I have had a lot of patients that they've told me they feel better. So that, that's a success in my book. Yeah, I certainly think that the women that I'm talking with, all who have had breast implant illness and who have had explant surgery, the women I'm talking with, the women who reach out to the Killer Boobies podcast, talk about massive improvements in their health. And, and that's why we really appreciate you taking the time with us because we know that you have educated yourself and taken the time to become an expert in explant surgery and that you've helped a lot of women improve their health. And so we really 
We really appreciate that. I have one, I have another question. This might sound kind of like a funny one, but some of the, some of the videos that I've seen online, not just from your office, but also from other doctors, it's kind of a horrifying experience. Some of the implants that are coming out of women uh, are mucky, sticky, gooey, broken. Tell us what you're finding in these explants. Uh, well, you know, I, I think that a lot of these videos that you see, of course, you know, they're kind of the most extreme, right? You know, not every woman with implant has calcifications or ruptures or, you know, all this sticky material. Um, that's more of an educational piece of, of, you know, things that can potentially happen. Um, what you see in the videos are calcifications. That's when the implants look kind of hard and calcified. That's the body's reaction to sometimes a rupture or sometimes just the body's reaction to a foreign body. Um, some doctors inject betadine, which is a brown material, into saline implants to try and prevent bacteria formation. So those implants come out a little brownish. Um, some, some capsules become very pathologic and just very nasty looking. Um, and those are probably some of the videos that, uh, that you're mm -hmm. seeing. Yeah. So you're the first person that's actually explained to me that the, the betadine can actually color the implant because I've seen those videos. And the first thought that goes through my mind is why on earth is it looking like the color of mud? And so you're saying the betadine actually colors the implant. It's not that the implant has turned nasty toxic. Is that right? That is, that is correct. Yeah. And that's usually seen or always seen it with, with a saline implant that a doctor's injected not only saline, but a little betadine solution as well. Okay, and then another question, because again, on some of your videos, um, when you remove the capsule, the shell itself is very tacky, sticky, gooey, and I think some people call it gel bleed. I was just wondering if you might be able to tell us what, what you think is happening with that one. Um, I, I think it is exactly like you said it. It's, the, the gel is, is bleeding from the implant itself penetrating the outer portion of the implant and, and, and kind of sticking around the interior of the, of the capsule there. So I think it's just silicone that's bleeding from the implant shell. Yeah, yeah. What do you think causes a rupture? What you mentioned just now is that sometimes a woman's body can calcify and, and create a problem, but what do you think is causing rupture for some implants? Um, it can be trauma. It could be, you know, a car accident, uh, a, a, a blow um, to the to the torso. Um, if a woman develops capsular contracture, which is contraction of the um, implant scar tissue around the implant, it can actually get so contracted that it can puncture the implant. I think that implants lose integrity of their outer shell over time, and like any any device, right? You lose the integrity over time. So women, particularly with silicone, um, should have their implants replaced um, if they're gonna keep them. Um, and, About how often do you think? Um, different doctors will give you a different time period, but I would say every eight years. Mm -hmm. um, and so some women that I do explants on too, they don't wanna have surgery every eight years. They wanna be done. Um, so. Um, with silicone implants, that is something you have to take into consideration as multiple surgeries over time. Yeah, I had to think about that too. And you know, it's funny because 12 years ago, when I got my plastic uh, surgery, my breast augmentation done, it wasn't until I came out of surgery that I learned that I needed to replace these and that they weren't lifetime devices. And then I started to laugh. I guess it was nervous laughter because at the time I was in my, um, let's see, at the time I was in my late 30s, and I thought, oh, if I had surgery as often it was recommended, then I could be looking at four more breast surgeries or more, depending on how old I live and depending on how long I wanted to have big breasts. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that was funny it, it, and it was sad to, uh, to find myself in a situation where I had to have more surgeries just because I started with the whole breast implant thing. Well, that should, again, that should be part of the informed consent. You know, if you have a silicone implant, you should look to replace every X amount of years. With saline, it's not as much the case, but um, with silicone, for sure. 
let's talk about your IV sedation because as I understand it, IV sedation is different than general anesthesia. Could you explain the difference? Yeah, so IV sedation, it's known as a twilight in some circles. Um, my thought process is if you can have the same results with less medicine going into your patient, um, less nausea, um, less wake up time, um, much more safe, um, then, then let's do it. So we've always explored techniques to, to give the minimum amount of anesthesia like a general general is the use of gas. So mm -hmm. some doctors will actually intubate the patient, which is a breathing tube and a lot of gas. We don't do that. Um, there's other techniques where you still get gas without intubation. Um, we have been very successful in doing what's called TIVA. It's total intravenous anesthesia, which is twilight. Uh, patients don't remember anything. They don't feel anything. And when they wake up, they're not throwing up and they're, you know, they're, they're ready to go saying, Hey, I'm ready to get out of here. And usually 30 to 40 minutes or less. Yeah. So they wake up and they're not even groggy, tired, foggy. Well, they're still sometimes a little tired because we do use, you know, some medications like Versag, which is sort of like, um, like a Valium. So, you know, they still kind of go home and, and, and want to rest up for that day. But uh, nausea is very important. A lot of the gases cause nausea. Um, and the last thing we want is our patients recovering and being nauseous because number one, it's miserable. And number two, if you're throwing up, it increases pressure in the body and it can increase uh, chances of hematoma or bleeding and, and just all things that we, we never want. Yeah, that's great. I know that I'm one of those gals that's super sensitive to general anesthesia and nausea is my number one problem. And uh, so it's nice that you can do the IV as an option. So if a woman is talking to her own surgeon and interested in doing that kind of technique, what is she gonna ask for? Um, I would just um, have the patient ask what type of anesthesia the, the doctor prefers to use. And uh, if they say, I do a general, say, hey, you think you could do my surgery with a sedation or just something a little more modified? Um, and I think most, most doctors are amenable to that. Have you seen an increase in the amount of women coming in for breast explant surgery? Um, I think, in some practices, yes, they are seeing more inquiries about breast explant surgery. Um, <clears throat> many of my colleagues will send those patients to me or someone that does a lot of explants because to be honest, to do an explant and to do a lift at the same time, it's, it's a unique challenge. Mm -hmm. It takes time, it takes experience um, to do it properly. Um, I get what I consider very good results in my practice. Is that true of every single patient? No, you know, I get, I get problems here or there that you know, drive my patients a little crazy as well as their doctor because I really take every patient to heart. Um, so there, there's a lot of challenges with it. And I don't think that every doctor wants to take on that challenge in their practice. Well, yeah, I think um, as a plastic surgeon, again, with my father-in-law being a plastic surgeon, his goal was to hit a home run every single time. And it's, it's a little easier when someone's going in for an augmentation to hit that home run because you, you never hear of a woman getting an augmentation and then not liking it, right? I will tell you, I loved my augmentation. I was really happy with it. What I didn't love was eventually my body rejected it and I got super sick. Um, so to reverse it, I was really quite scared. And so you're dealing, as an explant surgeon, you're dealing with women going into a potential disappointing surgery if they don't like the look of it. Is that right? A hundred percent. You know, you're, you're, you're basically going in reverse, right? Um, women get implants for upper pole fullness, volume, right off the bat, we're losing that. Um, then we have extra skin to deal with. So uh, absolutely, um, that's what makes it so challenging. Um, you know, like your father who you're talking about, um, you know, I take every patient to heart too. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably one of the biggest banes of my existence is <laughs> not being able to produce, you know, perfect results on every patient. It's really difficult for me. Yeah. But I think the thing that's most important is when someone's looking at a doctor like you for an explant surgery, most of those women are walking the path that I walked, which was I was really sick. I really needed to get the implants out. I felt it was the route to my illnesses. And um, I needed to find a 
surgeon that I trusted. So I feel like women that are walking into your office are often in the same boat. They're really sick. They feel like if they get the implants out, their health will improve. And they're looking to you as a trusted source who can remove the implants so that they can get better health. Uh, here's the question I'd like to ask you. When did you start putting the pieces together as a plastic surgeon that an explant surgery would help some people? Well, I was a skeptic, like many of my colleagues, um, when I started doing explant surgery. Um, as I started to do more explant surgery um, and just hearing the positivity and the happiness of my patients, that's when I you know, really um, became more interested in, in doing it um, more as a specialty. Um, you know, I look at every patient from a surgical standpoint, twofold. Number one is their health. And if they come back and say, I, you know, I feel better, I'm, I'm so happy, I have more energy. That's, that's part one. And then part two is the aesthetic. So if you can hit a home run on both, that's, that's a perfect surgery. Um, so that, that's, that's what really led me to wanting to do more explanting. So there's a, a lot of news reports and um, information in the breast implant awareness groups about breast implant illness. And I was just wondering if you might be able to uh, give us your idea on why you think some women's bodies mount an attack towards the breast implant. Um, people process things differently. Everybody's got a unique genetic makeup. Um, you know, the, the patients that I see that I explant on, they have a lot of medical issues. Um, they've been to a million doctors. They've spent a ton of money on specialists. And this is kind of the, um, the, the last stop, so to say, um, because they, they've ruled everything else out. So maybe this is contributing to some of the issues that they're having. Um, on, on the flip side, you know, I think it's important to mention that um, myself, my colleagues, I don't think anybody is saying breast implants are bad and every woman shouldn't have them and sh should have them removed because there are many, many women out there who do, do just fine with their implants. So I have patients that come in and say, hey, I have saline implants. They've been in place for nine years. I heard I need to get them removed. I say, hey, how are you feeling? And if they say they're feeling fine and doing fine, I say, you know, leave them in. You know, they're doing great for you. Yeah. So do you follow up with your patients to find out how their health is after they've had an explant surgery? Well, my local patients, they follow up with me on a regular basis. Um, I do have a lot of patients that travel. Um, all my patients every single one get my personal cell phone. Um, so I always encourage them if they have any questions to please send me a text, send me a picture. We can FaceTime. Um, so I always do try and keep in touch. I think in the future we would like to, and we've talked about doing some, just some studies and some research um, questionnaires, you know, how, how do you feel? Um, did you have any improvements in A, B, C, D, E, F, G and, and, and get, get a little bit more information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. I, I applaud you for considering doing research and to study your own uh, patients because that information I think can be really beneficial, uh, not just for patients out there, but for other doctors who are hearing rumblings about breast implant illness, but they don't know much. I think they're looking for doctors like you that do this on a regular basis to find out what your experience is. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Dr. Rankin, every year doctors have to go for continuing education in their field uh, of plastic surgery. Are you seeing any changes in the continuing education courses that will educate doctors about breast implant illness or about explant surgery? Um, you know, I, I have not seen too much in that regard as far as uh, education at this point. I mean, there's a lot of um, talks about, um, you know, what's going on, what the FDA is studying, what the American Society of Plastic Surgery is studying. I think it's just getting to the point where doctors are accepting that there is an issue and there, there needs to be further study. But there's, I haven't seen personally any courses on explanting or anything like that at this time. Well, I think that um, that's one of, the, one of the pushes is just informed consent. You know, with any type of surgery, you want to know your risks, you want to know benefits, alternatives, and possible complications. Um, and then you go in informed and you can make a decision for yourself. Um, and I think that um, 
you know, with the advent of, of social media and a lot of women getting together and talking and saying, hey, this, this is going on. Um, I, I think that the, um, the societies of plastic surgery, I think they're listening too, and they're saying, hey, you know, something's going on. Let's, let's study it. Let's, let's figure this out. Let's decide, you know, how we can test and, and let's get some more research on this. So I think their ears are open too. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's wonderful. I know that uh, your staff has a really great reputation in the breast implant awareness groups because um, they're helping a lot of women by answering a lot of questions and people have raved. Well, you know, my staff is all dedicated to our patients. You know, they're, they're, they're compassionate, um, they're knowledgeable. Um, I have um, three staff that are explant liaisons that basically just deal with answering questions and supporting our patients through the whole process. Um, so I think just taking a very compassionate approach to our patients um, is, is the way we approach things. You know, many of my staff have had explants as well. So to have somebody within the, the organization to be able to speak with the patients about their experiences, I think is really helpful as well. Let's be honest, Dr. Rankin, people have raved about you and your staff, about the compassion, not just from your staff, which is amazing, but also from you, that you take the time to look them in the eyes and to listen to their experience and to really understand it and then um, reassure them that they're in good hands. And that makes a big difference. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to talk to us about the mission that you have to help women get healthy? Um, you know, I think I touched upon it a little bit. Um, I became a doctor to help patients, right? Um, and um, I feel like what I'm doing is, is, is helping women. Um, and I think if you can improve someone's health, make them feel better, um, and they're still happy with the way they look. It's kind of a, you know, a, a home run on, on everything. That's the, and that's, that's my goal. That is so great. Well, again, Dr. Rankin, thank you for spending your time with us. I know that your patients rave about you. They, they appreciate your love, your compassion, your time. They appreciate the fact that you're an artist when it comes to the human body and that they're getting wonderful outcomes in terms of aesthetics and also in terms of their health. So just a final shout out to you and to say thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having me. And, and I, I truly love my patients and I love what I do. That's great. Yeah. Can you give us your website address or let us know how people can reach out to you if they want to schedule an interview or sign up to come into your surgery center? Yeah. So the name of my practice is Aqua Plastic Surgery, A-Q-U-A, PlasticSurgery.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram at David Rankin, MD. Um, so if you reach out through any of those means, we're on Facebook too, um, we'll get back with you just very promptly. Okay, great. I'll make sure I put those links in our show notes. Thank you so much. Uh, pleasure. Thank you for listening. Spread the word by subscribing, liking, and sharing the Killer Boobies podcast today. You could be the person who helps someone reverse their pain and suffering and reclaim their health today.